Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Please, as we make our way to our seats, uh, I am not Pastor Don. I have a little bit more hair. Da -na, da -na. <laughs> I am Keith, coughful, joyous, and glad to be with you, sending greetings all the way from down yonder uh, at Ann Ashley in 8th Avenue Place this morning. Uh, some announcements for today or for this week. The Homeless Ministry is accepting jars of peanut butter and jelly. We all have jars of peanut butter and je more peanut butter than we don't use in jelly. Um, all veterans, if you'd like to ride in the Memorial Day Parade, the contact information is at the bottom of the screen or probably in your bulletin. Today, 11 a.m. in the Word Bible Study, Jesus our Tuesday, excuse me, Jesus our King, First Floor Annex Hall. Uh, the schedule of the events happening on the week are before you. Any other announcements this morning? No? All right. So let us join together with this morning's opening prayer in unison. Please rise if you are able. All together, God of incredible surprises, as we gaze into the clouds, remind us that we are standing on holy ground, Place our feet in the pathways of peace and hope. Draw our attention from the vision of the Lord rising to the heavens to be with you. Help us to focus on the ministries that you would have us do. Keep us ready and willing always to serve you all our days. Amen. Friends, we look up to the heavens from where our help comes from. Our help together. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Not yet. All right. I didn't think you were paying attention. Let me do that again. All right. Ready. We look to the heavens from where our help comes from together. Our help is in the name of the Lord Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Jesus is alive, and he continues to care for us in the world. Glory be to the Father, the Son, amen. Friends, let us join together in this morning's hymn of praise, Fairest Lord Jesus, hymn number 189.
Friends, true worship is just not how we sing, but it's how we give back unto the Lord who's given us everything. So will the best looking ushers at Homestead Park please come forward. And any youth who'd like to come up, please do at this time. Friends, can we stand as we sing the doxology together? that be you guys know this one without the music come on let's do it again come on put the lyrics back up sir we got to do this one two three praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, we ask that these gifts be used for your glory and not for ours, for your kingdom and not for ours, so that this valley would be lifted high and people would know the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen. You all sound marvelous. You may be seated. So how can we pray together this morning? Any, any, any prayer requests? Raise a hand or I'll come down and we'll get this party started. Any prayer requests? Oh, we got a mic too? Okay. We got the minister in training with the mic here. So uh, if you have a prayer request, raise a hand and this young man will sprint to you. No, you got this, man. Come on. No, we just don't. Any prayer requests this morning? If not, just start handing it to people.
a, uh, a close friend of mine and um, co-worker um, recently passed away a couple days ago unexpectedly. Sorry um, his name lost. is Doug, and uh, I'd like to pray for him. Pray for Doug's family. And his family. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Prayers for Gene Conrad continually. He is uh, still in, in the hospital and will be for a while. So keep him and Glenda in your prayers. Okay, Gene Conrad and Glenda. Thank you, dear. We've been asking for prayers for Brian, our son, who's having surgery June 8th. And we're going to try to get him to church before then because I want you to meet the man you've been praying for. <laughs> And you're going to get a real treat if we can get him here. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Continues prayers for Brian and prayers that God's mercy would get him here. I have a praise that Charles actually achieved the, uh, the rank of the arrow of light. So he is done with Cub Scouts and he's moving upstairs to the troop. That sounds like a Star Wars thing, the, the arrowed light. Congratulations, gentlemen. Anyone else? So Mr. Chair gave me this. Uh, soon he will be at his last time in the National Guard. Is that right, sir? Yes. How, how long has the journey been? 51. 51 years. Wow. You told me you were 50 the other day, brother. <laughs> so we're going to bless this, uh, this shirt. That says U.S. Air Force veteran for his, uh, thank you for your service, brother, and for all you do for our community. Amen. <laughs> Father, we ask that you would bless this shirt and the one who wears it, the National Guard of servicemen and women around this world. We ask a day when we would no longer need to be at war, but at peace. And for all those who do what they do, be with them. Give your blessing upon Mr. Cherub and his family, Lord. He has done so much for us, but you do so much more. Bless this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I ask your prayers for Ann Ashley. We have and are going through the difficult journey of disaffiliation. Uh, we are official in terms of an annual conference. Uh, we will be leaving the Methodist Church. However, we are in ministry in the same valley. And our ties in Jesus are greater than our ties anything else. So we just pray uh, your mercy and grace upon us. Um, any other prayers? So friends, let us pray together that prayer that says it all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power. Friends, could you stand if you're able and let us sing together the hymn before the message, Glory to the Father, hymn number 95. Today's scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. If you didn't know, this is Ascension Sunday, and we as good Protestants, we don't talk about Ascension Sunday much, so we're going to journey together. And uh, Luke writes, in my former book, Theophilus, that's actually Scott Screen's middle name, Theophilus, it means God lover, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them with many convincing proofs. He was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised 
which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And I can just picture them looking up into heaven, and suddenly two men in white, a.k.a. angels, stood before them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky for the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go to heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Friends, would you pray with me and for me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Speak, O God, for we all need to listen. Amen. 1999, a movie came out called The Waiting Game. I promise you, none of us saw this movie. I didn't see this movie, but the, I heard of the plot, and it struck me. Okay, let me ask. Did anyone see this movie? Thank you. Prove my point. 19. <laughs> A, a group of aspiring young actors decide to make it big and move to New York City. They were going to be actors. But as a way to make ends meet, they work in a restaurant. Is that me? Yeah, whatever. Picture yourself. Put yourself in their shoes. You have this dream of something bigger than yourself. This is a dream that drives you and inspires you. It wakes you up in the morning. You have decided to give your entire life to this dream. But for now, you are stuck getting people iced tea and spilling food all over yourself. I'm just going to hold it. Yet something deep within you refuses to let you go. You know that there's more in life than just serving food. You truly believe that one day could be the day that changes everything. But you got to wait. The earliest followers of Jesus should have been experts in the waiting game. They were El of Israel. And at that time, they were an occupied and oppressed people group that waited for God to break in and set them free Two, they waited three long days as their savior, their friend, and their Lord was in a tomb dead. The disciples were with them 40 days, and now they were going to be put in a situation where they would have to wait again. Friends, there is one thing that we as American Christians, there's many things we don't do well, but one in particular is we don't wait on God well. Our problem is that we believe that we are, that the customer is always right, and we believe that we are the only customer. And since we're always right, then we believe that our timing is the only timing that truly matters. We all follow the gospel according to Burger King and not Jesus Christ. I stop by to tell you, Jesus does not work for Burger King. The great reformer Martin Luther said this, I have so much to do today that I must spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. What? I struggle to get three hours of prayer a year. Martin Luther says his life is so busy today that he must spend the first three hours in prayer. Think about his logic that before he attacks everything he has to do, he has to connect and wait on God. Friends, waiting on God may be difficult. Waiting on God may make us feel like we're lazy. We, must, we may feel like nothing is happening. But Psalm 46.10, God speaks and says, Be still and know that I'm the Lord. Be still. And the Hebrew word for be still means to sink down. 
In other words, let go. Let God. I've experienced three things in my life on what waiting on God does. The first thing is this. Waiting on Jesus humbles us because it shows us that God does not work according to our schedule in that we will learn very humbly that whatever we do will either be done according to God's ways or on God's timing or it won't be done at all. So what does waiting on God do? It humbles us. Two, waiting on God trains us. We learn to trust God in our waiting because while we're waiting on God, we have two options. We will either draw closer to God or we will get farther away. I'll never forget it. Uh, when we started 8th Avenue Place, we made it three years, and then we got a letter from the conference in September that said, come November 1st, this is how much money you have in your bank account. In case you don't know my sign language, this is a zero. And I was so convinced that God sent me in the homestead with a vision and a plan and a strategy, and yet there was no money. So I had a, we had a little apartment in West Homestead where you can only fit five people. We used to fit 10 and a 20-pound cat. And we used to have prayer meetings and praise time. And the amazing thing is, the more and more we began to meet, the less and less it became about the money and the more and more it became about Jesus. And when did you know it that we got another letter that said they were going to support us for the rest of the year. So what does waiting on God do? It trains us that God will always show up even if whatever's due at 12, he'll show up at 11.59. So what happens is we start to believe that if God did it back then, God can do it again. So waiting on God humbles us. Waiting on God trains us. And the first thing that waiting on God should do, the third thing, is produce within us a thankful spirit. We realize that all good and perfect gifts come from God's hand, not just our hard work. What does the great hymn say? Great is thy faithfulness, all I have needed, your hand has provided. So the disciples were eating with the resurrected Jesus, and Jesus says this, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, there's that word again, but wait for the gift promised by the Father, which you have heard about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days from now, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was giving them instructions as if he was not going to be with them, and perhaps he knew their tendency to leave when things became uncertain. Jesus says the only way they would receive the gift was if they waited. I know some of us have been waiting for a long time. Don't give up. They gathered around Jesus, and they said, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the seasons, the times the Father has set by his own authority. But Jesus says, this is what you will know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus does not say... If you wait, you will get what you want. Jesus says, if you wait, you will get what God wants to give. So many people I've met have become disillusioned with the Christian faith because we have given them the wrong perception that God is a Santa Claus that gives us what we want as long as we think we're good. When the reality is this, how many know that if God gave us what we wanted, some of us probably won't be here today? If they wait, they will receive the gift that God wants to give. And that is that they will receive power. And the Greek word for power is dunamis, where we get that word dynamite. Beloved, how many know this, that we can't make it on our own strength? The love I give my daughters from my own heart is not enough. We need a power that, that trusts in God, waits on God, shows the world what it means to belong to God. That power is God's Holy Spirit that supernaturally works in us to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, to forgive people in situations that we cannot forgive on our own, to love people that are unlovable, and even to forgive ourselves who many times we think we're unforgivable. But they got to wait. 
So after Jesus said this, here's where I wish we had a video camera. There he goes, taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now I wonder if any of the disciples that were watching this happen said to themselves, not again. Just as things were getting back to normal, as if eating dinner with a guy who was dead and rose from the dead is normal. Just when things were getting back to normal, just when ministry was getting back in the routine again, there goes Jesus, <clears throat> lifted up, taken up, in a cloud. As I said before, most of us good Protestants, we love Christmas time. We love talking about the Son of God became flesh. We love the Christmas Eve services where we sing the hymns so full of rich theology that God has come and there's hope and there's light. And then we journey throughout the Christian calendar and we come to the Holy Week where we journey with Jesus to his cross and that tragically beautiful day of Good Friday. Then we celebrate Easter and he rose from the dead. But we never ask, now where is he? What happened to Jesus? Is that, is that the end of the story? No. Acts tells us that the story is that Jesus physically was taken up. And although Jesus was physically hidden from them, Jesus is now physically at the right hand of God the Father. And next week, we will celebrate the Holy Spirit comes among us. But for right now, we've got to ask ourselves, what does it mean that Jesus is right now at the right side of God the Father? What does it mean for us? Friends, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that right now in heaven, you have one who stands before the throne of God on your behalf, that we have a representative who speaks and acts on our behalf. The devil may say one thing, your doubts and fears may say another, but the good and powerful word of Jesus Christ is what the Father listens to. And right now, Jesus is praying for you and advocating for you. How do you know God likes coffee? This is a good joke I just made up. Come on. Because he brews. <laughs> I've been hanging with Scott Green. I got... I got dumb funeral director jokes all day long. He brews is just not a joke Scott Green tells. He brews is a book in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about Jesus as the great high priest. Now, for many of us Gentile folk, that, that line means absolutely nothing. But in the is ancient Israel, the high priest was one who was one who would represent the people before a holy God and a holy God before the people. And once a year, he would go into this place called the Holy of Holies, and he would make atonement for the sins of the people. And this was serious business because people have died going into the presence of God. And he would wear this breastplate that would have in it the names carved in stones of all the tribes of Israel so that when he went into the presence of God, he represented all of them before God. Hebrews says, we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and because of that, we hold firmly to the faith we profess. It is a certain thing that God hears us, not because of how good we are, not because of how many times we go to church or read the Bible. God hears us because God is sitting next to his son, Jesus Christ, and when we pray to Jesus and through Jesus, and praise God through Jesus, everything that is ours, Jesus takes and he gives to the Father on our behalf. So we can boldly come. And then Hebrew says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, yet did not sin. Therefore, let us approach God's throne of grace and confidence that we may uh, receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How astounding is it that God Almighty, who is the creator in the absolute definition of holiness, knows what it's like to be like you and I. Not from a distance, but through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus faced 
the fullness of human emotion. He tasted joy. He felt loss. He felt love. He felt alone. He faced utter rejection by those that said they loved him. He was tempted in every way except he did not sin. What does that mean for us? Because God knows who he's dealing with, with us ragtag bunch of people, we don't need to pretend we're something that we're not. We don't need to hide. After Adam and Eve did what they were told not to do, God shows back up in the garden like he always did. And except this time, instead of running to God and walking with God, Adam and Eve run the opposite direction and they hide because they were ashamed. Guilt is I feel bad for what I've done. Shame is I feel bad because of who I am. Because of Jesus, in and through Jesus, instead of having to run and hide from God, we can run towards God in our broken state with humble boldness. Now, I know what some of us may be thinking. So does that mean let's go out and sin and come back to Jesus? How many know this? That if you coming, truly come to Jesus, you don't want to sin any longer. Doesn't mean we won't. It means we... We don't want to. That desire has been broken. And, and, and we could come with boldness, meaning this, that our boldness is not based upon our achievement, but the boldness we have to approach God is 100% based upon the person and the perfection of Jesus Christ. And when we approach the Father's throne, there will not be a sign that says, sorry, out to lunch, be back in an hour. How many know that we won't last an hour apart from the presence of God? And I love how this scripture ends. It says, we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. Did, did, did you get that? We will receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And friends, I found that if you're like me, when in the heat of the moment when things really get bad, sometimes God is the last person we go to. We may say, oh God, help me, but then we run and we go seek the doctor, the lawyer, the Oprah Winfrey Scott, where he goes to get his wisdom at, right? No, but what this is saying is that everything we need, God will provide. But the question is, will we accept what God wants to give? Friends, no matter what you face, no matter how small, no matter if it's your finances, family issues, addiction issues, illness, come to the throne of God and you will find mercy and grace to help you with what you need. So, these men are looking up into heaven and I just wish I could have seen them just up there like, wow, how do you pull that one off? And as they're sitting there fixated on the sky, these two angels show up to them and they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken away from you and gone into heaven, he will come back the same way you've seen him go. So the waiting game began that day, and the waiting game continues today. And my friends at Homestead Park, I hope that you have a dream a dream of something bigger than yourself. And I hope that deep within you is something deep that refuses to let you go. And I encourage you to truly believe that one day, one day will be the day that changes everything. Because this Jesus who went up into heaven, he's going to come back the same way. Let us say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Father, we face such difficult times. And it is so easy for us to seek wisdom and counsel from so many things and so many people. 
I pray, O oh God, that you'd give us a heart that would seek the scriptures, a heart that would seek you. For those of us who are waiting on change, let them know that you hear them and you wait for them to come. And you do all good things for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Amen. Friends, in response to the grace and mercy of God, let us stand and sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. It's a hard one to sing, isn't it? <laughs> Rejoice anyways. For Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, loving you, praying for you, listening to you. You are not alone. Now go forth in the name of God the Father who loves you so much he sent Jesus to save you. And they have given you the Holy Spirit to remind you that if God is for you, nothing can stand against you. Go forth in the name of the King, Jesus Christ. Amen.